Now we are going to talk about authorities, identity, and real names. So, so far we've talked about two kinds of examples of uh, identities, uh, accounts in a cryptocurrency system like Ethereum, and also accounts on websites like Twitter and social media accounts. And I think that everyone can tell that these really don't behave the same way as real names or the kinds of identity that you would get issued by a government. And the, where it comes to DeFi, there's a, a really specific way in which these behave differently. So when you borrow in DeFi, you always have this kind of over collateralization. If you wanted to do the borrowing of $90 worth of tokens, you would typically have to deposit more than that $100 worth of Ethereum in order to initiate the deposit. Um, in the previous lectures, we talked about how DeFi synthetic instruments could work along these lines. The significance of that over collateralization is that if the price moves such that you are now insolvent, your position will automatically be liquidated at some point, but that's the maximum that can happen. Uh, if Alice is insolvent, she can just run away with whatever tokens she has borrowed. Um, the mechanism is going to liquidate all of that um, uh, Ethereum, it's going to try to counteract the effect of the you know loss in price as much as it can, but all of Alice's other positions and other mechanisms or her other addresses on the same chain, all of those are going to be completely unaffected. She can abandon her position and the only thing that the smart contract mechanism can do about it is whatever it can do with the initial security deposit ma she made and that's it. And we know that this isn't how things work in the real world. Uh, in the real world of ordinary banks and government identities, the TradFi world, uh, when you go to borrow, you don't um, over collateralize, you don't deposit $110 in order to borrow $100. You just go and borrow the $100. And the reason why is that in the system of identities and credit, uh, credit scores, you can't just run away um, it's like a brick wall if you try to escape your, your credit score. Uh, eventually, you can they'll send a repo man or collections would go after you. And um, the record that you don't pay back the $100 that you borrowed, that goes on your permanent credit score, and it um, uh, doesn't go away that easily. So just to briefly summarize these very intuitive differences between real name identities and accounts online, uh, you can't abandon your legal real name identity uh, the way that you can a social media account. You can't successfully escape debts just by changing your name, for example. If there's a warrant out for your arrest, then you know abandoning your, your name doesn't help either. Um, you can't just create multiple different identities and use whichever one suits you uh, uh, at the time. You have one identity and you know, that repo guy can go take some other assets that you have because of a debt that you occurred in one system. Um, and you're also not allowed to sell your identity. You can't just transfer ownership of yourself to some other entity. The um, way that real names work in ordinary society and in the legal system, that's not something that you're allowed to do. Now, real names and authoritative IDs, these are required in a lot of places uh, that you encounter in the DeFi world, such as signing up for a centralized exchange. You have to pass their know your customer checks and present your ID. Even using an automated cryptocurrency ATM, depending on how much you are trying to deposit or withdraw, you'll have to present a government issued ID there as well. There are many specific regulations that create some specific requirements to use identity of a certain kind. Um, so one is um, the OFAC sanctions list. So this is a, an agency in the U.S. government that publishes a sanctions list. And if um, you are a financial institution that is processing a transaction, then in order to comply with the sanctions list, you're required to um, check that the a uh, person or entity that you are sending the transaction to does not appear on this list. And you have to check this public list and make sure that who you're sending the money to isn't on that list. A second place where this shows up is the travel rule, which is part of the Bank Secrecy Act in the US. It's something that any money services business must comply with, and exchanges are considered money services business. 
and roughly what it says is that you have to collect and store um, information about the, the real name identity of uh, your client and if your client is using your money service business to transmit money to someone else you have to also collect and store um, the, the real name identity of who is the recipient of this transaction. All right, and cryptocurrencies and many service providers in the cryptocurrency ecosystem are, are considered money services businesses, um, so these rules would apply to them. There's an inherent tension between privacy and, and uh, accountability here, which is that these regulations say that you have to uh, collect and retain certain kinds of identifying information, and that would seem to go at odds with um, the privacy goals. So let's discuss a couple of features of the identity system as a whole uh, associated with real names and legal IDs that are a little bit less obvious. So one is that you always have the ability to show up in person and reissue your credentials and identity documents if you've lost them or they get stolen. Um, it may be time consuming or difficult to do, like if you lose your passport and have to show up to a, a government office to get it reissued, um, but it can be done. And that's a feature of the system surrounding identity overall. Another uh, protection that is associated with your real name and your persistent identity is that there are a bunch of protections and uh, liabilities associated with uh, the use of your personally identifying information. So a service provider that has a data breach um, that involves losing the uh, identifying information of their customers, they can end up having some obligation to uh, report this to security agency of the government and to uh, notify their users about it. What this means is that the personally identifying information, it's actually a liability uh, for a company to have to interact with and store. All else equal, they would prefer to store as little of this as possible to avoid that liability. Another interesting example is the right to be forgotten. This generally refers to European Union laws like GDPR, although similar facets of this exist in the US as well. Uh, what the right to be forgotten roughly says, uh, among other things, is that if you are a service provider that stores some personally identifying information, even because you received consent uh, from the subject to store that information about them, if they change their mind and want to ask you to remove all of that information that you were storing, uh, well then, in the typical case, you're required to respect their request and, and go ahead and get rid of that, that information, allowing them to be forgotten. So there's some limits associated with storing personally identifying information. The final example that I'll give here is um, the identity, uh, the uh, uh, potential for bankruptcy protections. So I gave the example of how your credit score is permanent and you can't just walk away from a debt by um, you know, pretending that you changed your name. Well, there are limits to how much a debt can follow you, and in particular, you can declare bankruptcy, and that has the effect of canceling all of the debts um, associated with you. It harms your credit score, starts it over again uh, from scratch. It's also difficult, and there are a lot of processes that go along with it, and it only works for some kinds of debts. It doesn't apply, for example, to student loans, among some other things. Um, but in general, um, it is possible to go bankrupt, and that's one thing that can have the effect of starting your credit score again over. I give all of these examples mainly because uh, any attempt to make an alternative to the existing real name legal identity system should probably try to satisfy some of these desirable properties. It would be easy, for example, to make uh, an alternative identity system that ends up not having any form of bankruptcy uh, relief whatsoever, and that could end up being you know, less humane than the, the current ID system that we're used to.